yeah. for Black History Month, I want to kind of highlight some Black coaches from, you know, all divisions, either D1, D2, D3, you know, everything. Okay. And why not start with Coach Shelton, who won the Division One championship? You know, you're the head coach at the Gators. You know, why not start with the biggest and the baddest? <laughs> I appreciate that, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, so let's just start from the beginning. And I just want to ask the first question is, where did the love of tennis begin? Oh, gosh, it started at a young age. You know, I was eight years old in Huntsville, Alabama, where I grew up and I was on my bike and I just, uh, one summer day, I was just riding my bike and I saw two courts at a junior high school and a bunch of kids out there playing tennis. And I just kind of stood by the fence and watched. And next thing you know, one of the coaches, I think there's only one coach out there with probably 12 kids. He said, uh, hey, you want to come inside and, and join in? I was like, sure. So I jumped out there. I, I, I joined in the clinic uh, that day. He invited me back the next day. At the end of the session of that camp, he, he had a serving contest and I actually won it. And uh, I, I uh, won a racket. You know, I didn't own a racket at that point in time, but I won a racket for winning the serving contest. They gave me a Jack Kramer autograph, Wilson racket, and I was hooked. <laughs> uh, finding any wall I could hit off of and just a ball and a racket and you know, just kind of fell in love with, you know, trying to get that ball over the net inside those lines, you know, and chasing them down. So it started there. And, and I was fortunate, you know, throughout my, my childhood, you know, while I was living in Huntsville with my parents to get a coach that really understood the game really well and knew how to teach it. Um, a guy named Bill Tim, who's still my mentor today. And uh, he just increased my love for the game. And kind of like Lori McGill did for you. He really taught me the nuances of the game and, and just opened my mind to the possibilities of playing it at a high level. So you had a pretty eventful, you know, college career. I think you played at Georgia Tech, if I remember correctly. And you started coaching at um, Georgia Tech. So I just want to say, what made you want to stay in college tennis? I saw that you'd worked at the USTA, you played on the tour. So what made you want to stay in college tennis? Well, it kind of it kind of came after me, you know, I didn't chase it, you know, um, I got a call um, about two years after I retired from playing uh, from a guy named Kenny Thorne who's one of my best friends in life. Um, and we played together on the team at Georgia Tech years ago, and he was the men's coach at the time uh, at Georgia Tech and the women's job opened up and he thought I'd be a great candidate for the position. And I wasn't quite sure, you know, um, getting into college coaching, doing it on the female side, uh, not having a ton of experience in coaching in general, even though I'd been out there playing on the tour for 10 years and worked for the USTA for almost two, um, to come in and be a head coach right away and be in charge of the program, that seemed like a tall task. But, uh, you know, the AD at the time uh, at Georgia Tech was a guy named Dave Brain. And. He had a vision for both programs being successful and moving in the right direction. And he thought that I'd be the right guy to help with that vision and, and trying to execute it. So I ended up taking the position. Um, I, I don't know that I was 100% committed when I, when I took it, but within a year afterward, I realized this is exactly where God intended me to be. And there was, there was just no doubt that I was supposed to be there at Georgia Tech working with that program uh, next to my best friend and, uh, and see if we could develop something really special. Sounds like you did. You had a pretty eventful run at Georgia and now you're having a pretty eventful run at Florida. So I have to ask, what's the best part of being a college tennis coach? Oh, I think the, I mean, helping young people make that transition from being at home under the watchful eye of parents and coaches and, and kind of having that, that, uh, that safety around them to all of a sudden going off to college and having to make that transition to all of a sudden developing more independence, uh, being able to make more choices for yourself, being able to manage your time and learning how to do that better, uh, really making that transition and becoming a young adult you know, going from the kid stage to the young man or young woman stage. And for me, 
being a part of that development is special, you know, not just on the court, but off the court as well and teaching them and helping them develop the skills that are going to help them throughout the rest of their lives and throughout the rest of their tennis careers. Um, so I think being a part of that, I mean, there's so much energy in college tennis, as you know, and to be part of that energy, I'm 56 years old now and still feeling young because I'm around 18, 19, 20 year olds all the time that are silly and funny and crazy and, and that bring all of this energy and excitement to what we do. And you only have to go to a one or two college matches to feel that. I agree. You know, I'd always try to explain to my friends. I'm like, you just got to come to one match. Just come to one match. We'll see what it's like. You know, right. it's, it's not a football game. It's not a basketball game. It's a lot more fun and not a lot more fun, but you know, I believe it's a lot more fun. <laughs> uh, so, have, so what does being a black college tennis coach mean to you? I know, you know, you're not, you're starting to see a lot of diversity within, you know, tennis as a whole. Um, I had Lori McNeil to kind of mentor me through the game. I'm sure you've had some mentors to mentor you through the game. And then I saw that you work with Jamia at the USTA. And I also work with Jamia a little bit when she came to Carson. Yeah. So what does being a black college tennis coach mean to you in 2022? Well, I think it's, it's, it's awesome, you know, to have the opportunities that I've had throughout my entire tennis life, you know, it's just been one thing after another to, to be able to, number one, you know, develop as a tennis player, it's not easy as a kid. You know how that is. It's There's sacrifices, especially coming from a lower middle income family and trying to get involved in this sport. It's very difficult. So I had parents that were super, super supportive of me, you know, trying to live out my dreams and being able to try to take this tennis as far as I possibly could. And I had coaches that were supportive and helpful in a way that allowed me more opportunities when we couldn't afford them. And so with all those opportunities comes some responsibility as well. And so I feel that as a coach, I feel the responsibility to always look to give back, to look to help others, um, to understand why I'm here and that I've got a purpose. God's given me a purpose in my life to really try to help others to be successful and to grow and develop. And through that, I've been able to do the same and continually learn and grow and develop myself. And we never, ever reach that, that, that uh, perfect status, but there's still opportunities, you know, and I'm still learning today after being in college tennis for almost 23 years. You know, I'm still learning every single day from my athletes, from my assistant coaches, from other people in other sports and outside of sports and constantly gaining knowledge and understanding and and continually to try to trying to learn from the mistakes as well. But being a black college coach, you know, uh, at the University of Florida, I think there's a lot of young coaches and players that look at me and and want to see why is he successful you know why, why are his teams and their programs continually doing well and so to be able to share some of the things that i've learned along the way with young coaches and young people that are getting involved in this sport i think that's a that's a opportunity for me you know to give back and and to also try to set the right example for everybody you know not just my own team or my own coaching staff or my support staff but just everyone in general, this is, this is the way that you want to try to go about trying to live your life, understanding that there's priorities. There's things that are more important than hitting a tennis ball. You know, tennis is great, but really what we're doing is tennis is serving as a vehicle to help us in the game of life. And so that's constantly my message to everybody that I work with and that I get a chance to speak to is like, make sure you understand the why. Okay, if you really understand the why you're involved, the why you want to do certain things, then it kind of gives you the motivation every day to wake up in the morning with, with excitement and enthusiasm and understanding that you can make an impact. And if, if I'm able to impact some other people in a positive way, then I feel fulfilled, more so than just winning tennis matches. You know, winning's great. We all love it, you know, but it's not the end all. Even when we've won a national championship at Georgia Tech when we won in 2007 or 
as we won the national championship in 2021 here at Florida. The next day we get up, we have breakfast, we go on with our daily routines and we keep moving forward. So it's never an end. It's always just enjoying the moments, making the most out of each moment, learning from the failures and the success and continually trying to keep moving forward and helping others to move forward along with me. And so, you know, just a great, great opportunity, great responsibility. Um, and just, you know, just a, a big blessing to be in the position that I've been able to be in all these years. That's amazing. I agree with what you say. Now that I'm getting a little older, yeah, I can appreciate <laughs> everything <laughs> that tennis has given me. When I was like 15 to like 22, I was like, if someone would ask me, like, do you like Joyce Tennis? I'm like, I'm just out here hitting balls. I really don't know <laughs> what, what is going on. Now that I'm 25, even last year I was 24, I'm starting to appreciate and see, you know, all of the doors that tennis has opened for me, right. all the lessons that tennis has uh, taught me, right. uh, the connections. It's just amazing to see, yeah. you know, all of that started from a little green ball. Yeah. And it's, it's funny, Elizabeth, you know, as I look back at the different players that I've coached through the years and, you know, there's, there's a lot of players that go through struggles in college, you know, and, and it's not just going out there and playing great tennis all the time and everything going your way. There's personal stuff that you deal with on a regular basis. There's tennis issues. I mean, I've had players that have you know, had a hard time to relax and just play freely out there on the court. And I think that's something that's not easy to overcome. And so it sometimes makes the game more challenging and not as much fun. And so, you know, but for players to kind of learn as they go through and kind of get a perspective on things like you have, uh, at some point, a lot of those players come back to me and go, you know, I get it now. And I'm glad that I went through it because had I not gone through some of those struggles or whatever, I really wouldn't be the person that I am today, you know? And so there's, there's a purpose and a reason that we go through the things. And then if we start to really understand that, then everything's a positive. You lose a match, there's positive things that you can gain from it. You know, you go through a struggle, you're going to help. It's going to help you to appreciate the good stuff that much more, you know? And understand it's more than just winning and losing. It's about the relationships and other things that are way more important. I agree. So I have to ask, it's a family affair for the Shelton family at Florida. You've got your son on the men's team and you've got your daughter on the women's team. Was it planned? Was this all planned? You know, it's it's funny. You know, when we, when we moved here to Florida, you know, it's been now... Um, Let's see, it's been 10 years now since we moved from, from Atlanta to Gainesville. And the kids were involved in, like my daughter was involved in tennis at that point. My son was more involved in football and other sports. And he would proudly proclaim that tennis was not going to be his sport. He was not going to follow my footsteps or his sister's footsteps or even his mom's. And he was going to do his own thing. And so it wasn't an early plan, but it's amazing how things things kind of shifted um, towards tennis and both of my kids getting involved and being super competitive and wanting to play tournaments and kind of developing as they went along. And then, you know, I think that uh, Emma was, you know, the first and she's 18 months older than Ben and she really wanted to go and do her thing uh, outside of Florida. And so she left and went to South Carolina for two years and, and then Ben came here his freshman year. Just fortunate that that worked out. And uh, it's been a blessing to have him on the team and to have him be part of our championship season last year was, was really special. Um, and then on top of everything, for Emma to come back and decide, hey, I want to transfer and I want to come to Florida and for the coaches here to welcome her on the team and for her to be here now, it's just like, wow, it's overwhelming. Just the uh, just amount of gratitude that I have to be able to be with my wife, who's been the rock and just been so solid in our family. Um, and then to have both kids playing here, uh, I was able to watch uh, my son and the team play uh, a match this weekend on Sunday. 
And then the women's team played right after us. So I just stayed here and got to watch my daughter compete right afterward with her, with her team. And, you know, it's just pretty special. I don't say that it was planned, but I guess God has a plan and uh, he, he knew what was, what, what needed to be done. And to have us all here together is pretty special. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I must see. Um, now that we're starting to see a lot of the players that have played on college tennis, you know, make that transition to the tour. I have to ask you a, a question about that. Um, back in the day, you know, even when I played at the USTA, it was very looked down upon to play collegiate tennis. Like it was really, you know, either you're going professional or it's a bust. And now you're starting to see a lot of people that played collegiately start to make that transition to having a lot of success with Daniel Collins, Maxine Cressy, um, even on the double side with Raji Ram and Ashibahara and players like that. What does that mean for you guys now as a recruiting tool? Is that like something that's helped you guys to try to say, you know, now that, you know, you don't necessarily have to make that jump at 16, 17 to go professional. Now you can come play at college and kind of mature a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Elizabeth. You make a good point, you know, to, to be able to go to school, get an education, number one, and then continue to develop and mature, number two. Um, I think those things are so important and there's so much value in that, that it kind of, the hardest thing about going out there and playing professional tennis is number one, it's a lonelier life. You're doing it on your own. You're not really part of the team. And so you've got to figure things out on your own and not everybody's out there to help you because they're all trying to make it too. So that lonely existence on the tour is tough, especially when you start taking losses which obviously at 16, 17 years old, you're gonna be competing against people that have been out there on tour or playing at that level for 10, 15 years. And so it takes a while to develop the, the experience that you need to be able to be successful at that next level. And so what you see, I think in the last 10 years, you saw a lot of players go out there, turn professional, and then just toil out there in kind of mediocrity. and and it gets very tough. And then at the end of the day, the majority of those players end up quitting and then eventually hopefully going back to school and getting an education. Why not go on the front end and go get your education, be part of a team, grow up, mature, thicken your skin, deal with some different things and situations, socially develop, you know, so that you have an understanding of what's really important in life. And then when you get an education and you've got that degree in your pocket and you still have that desire and the dream to go and play at the next level, there's an understanding that players are playing much longer now than they used to. You used to be 30 years old and you're done. Now, you know, look at, look at Feder and look at Nadal and look at these guys that continue to play on into their 30s. Look at Venus and Serena and just the longevity that these players are having is pretty special. And so now go to school. You still can continue to improve and develop and get better, uh, get an education, you know, and a lot of times, you know, you get a scholarship and it's paid for, you know, uh, you've got the best facilities in the world. You've got a ton of coaches and strength coaches. And, you know, at this level at University of Florida, we've got massage therapists, we've got sports psychologists, we've got, and we've got everything that you need to continue to grow and develop and get better. And so, why not take advantage of that? And you're not having to pay for it and you're getting an education. So I think there's so many more reasons why to go to school than there are to turn pro. And I think most tennis players, unless you're one of those rare one percenters, it's the best option. I agree wholeheartedly, very much so. Yeah. So I have to ask, you know, you're trying to defend the national title this year. Is the approach to defending the national title any different from last year? Is everything exactly the same, going about it exactly the same? I think we learn, you know, constantly, constantly learning. And so there'll be some things that we'll do a little bit differently this year based on, you know, evaluating what happened last year. And winning the championship was great, but we still made some mistakes along the way. We still did some things that if we could do over again, we would have changed. So we try to learn from even our success and still work to get better. It's kind of like the, 
the leading companies out there, Apple. Apple's not just satisfied that they've got the market share. They're figuring out how can we improve that and keep getting better because someone else is going to be working to get better, doing you know their R and D and and improving their product and improving you know what they offer. And so we've got to continue to do the same thing because there's a lot of teams that are getting better, you know. And so our approach in a lot of the ways is the same, as far as we want to work hard every day and we want to have fun while we're doing it. You know, um, someone told me that. You know, when Billy Donovan won the NCAA basketball championship here at the University of Florida, and they tried to repeat the next year that the first couple months they were miserable, you know, with the kind of the weight of the world, like, oh, we got to repeat, we got the same group back and we should do this. And every loss was magnified. The wins didn't feel as good. It was almost like they were supposed to do that. And I think his advice is make sure you continue to have fun. It's got to be fun. It's got to be fun. Can't ever forget why we got in this game. You know, the joy of playing a game and then the joy of doing it as part of a team. <laughs> Nothing's better. I had a couple wins like over Agassi and some other big players when I was on a professional tour. Great wins. Nothing compares to winning with a team like at Georgia Tech or here at Florida. You know, none of the things that I did individually can compare to what we did as a team and so why not make the most out of it and enjoy this year and enjoy every opportunity that we have in practice as well as the matches and so that's my my thing for our team this year is make sure that we stay humble uh, stay hungry but have fun along the way so i think that's what we're trying to do most this this season keep a level heart i see you that's right so the last question that i have Okay. is there's a new generation of black college coaches just getting started in college tennis. You know, they're kind of working their way up, you know, from those small schools to trying to get to the big approach, the big leagues. What would you say to them if you were in their shoes? Yeah, that's a great question. I've had that opportunity to be able to speak to some of these young coaches. And, you know, I my thing is just to try to inspire them to just continue to look at the big picture, uh, understand that if you do things the right way consistently, uh, you have high standards for yourself, for your staff, for your athletes, um, and you, you enjoy the process along the way, good things are going to happen. You're going to continue to develop and grow and get better, you know, and being able to network together, I think is really important because that's how we learn by sharing ideas with one another, you know, and reaching out when you have questions. Because sometimes, you know, you think, oh, I'm a head coach here. I should have all the answers. We don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers, but I know there's some people that I can call on that can help me when I'm trying to make difficult decisions, you know, and, and, and there's going to be things that come up throughout your coaching career that are delicate situations that you're going to have to figure out how to navigate your way through. And those, how you, how you make those decisions, that's going to either elevate you or it's going to bring you down. And so we want to really take our time before we have to make those important decisions. And so when something arises, always take a deep breath and it's better to say, I'm going to sleep on that. I'm going to think on that before making your decision, especially the critical decisions that you're going to have to make, whether you're upset about some, somebody messing up or you've messed up, take your time, you know, consult some people that you really trust and that you think that can help you along the way and, and take your time in making those difficult decisions. And then when you make them, you know, own up. If you make a mistake, own up to it. Your athletes, your staff, everybody else will, will respect you more when you say, hey, that was my bad. That's on me. You know, we went to Arkansas one year and took a loss and I was upset after the loss and I realized I hadn't prepared the team well enough and the other team played really well. And so in the locker room afterward, I said, that's on me, you know, and the guys looked up at me thinking I was going to be upset with them. And no, I took responsibility and it's something that really helped us throughout the season. Because then they realize that, hey, it's not, it's not, you know, us against them. It's all of us working together. 
you know, and we're going to make some mistakes. Part of it. When I went to Georgia Tech, I made a lot of mistakes, still making them, you know, and it's, it's whether or not you learn from them, admit that you made them, learn from those mistakes, and don't let them define you. Let your response define you, how you come back from adversity, how you come back from, from making some mistakes. Uh, we're all going to make those. That's just part of life, you know, and so those are the things that I talk to young coaches about, you know, trying to look at the long-term approach versus just what's going to get you through today or tomorrow or this week or this season, but always kind of look a little bit further out to say, is this going to be the right thing for our future? And so in today's world, it's like microwave everything, right? <laughs> I need it now. <laughs> and so it's like, no, no, calm down, calm down, be patient. It's hard when you're young, when you're 25, you know, it's hard to be patient, but be patient and good things. If you keep doing things the right way, good things will happen for you.